Once again, there's a little off. A very pleasant good morning to everybody. And welcome to TSK Marketing's first webinar of the new season. And before we get any further, and as we allow more attendees to join us, I'm going to turn it over to a very familiar face. I feel like we're in the Brady Bunch. I'm little... Hi there, Terry. I'm going to turn it over to Terry good Kay. Good morning, Jim. Terry, take it away and uh, let's say hi to everybody. Happy New Year. Welcome back, everyone. And yes, Happy New Year. Um, we're glad to have you all back. We're going to start with A1 Appliance for our first service provider webinar of the season. We're all um, excited about our new website and the service providers that have signed up. We're going to do things a little different this season. And we're going to try to have you, people have um, written in questions when they registered. We're going to try to start by having some of your questions answered up front while people are registering. And we have somebody who's going to help us by um, having your questions answered and doing some interviewing. Jeff's going to make those introductions. Um, then we're going to have, we're going to turn over to the four credit program. And then we will stay after because they may not all get answered, but certainly we will do as many as we can after the program. And then uh, certainly Fred will get in touch with you if we still haven't been able to. And the fun part of this is that we've added a certificate. So when you turn in your evaluation, you will get a certificate to use whenever you need A1 appliance services. So with that, I'll let Jeff do the introduction so we can keep things uh, rolling. Welcome back. If you'd like to be on the website, give us a call. Go ahead, Jeff. Thank you. All Thank yours. you, Terry. And I must admit, I cheated a little bit because I, I had Fred's uh, presentation ahead of time and I, and I did something with one of my appliances last night before using it and it worked much better. So you'll, you'll learn about that in a short bit here. Before we get started and uh, the way you're gonna ask your questions, I wanna go over a couple of brief, sets, uh, brief set of instructions here. And hopefully you're all seeing this screen here. We've got the chat disabled today, that, that can get a little chaotic and confusing. So we want to have as uh, streamlined a process as possible. You'll type in your questions with the Q&A function and you can type them in at any time. This way you do not forget what, what it is you wish to ask. And then at the time uh, that it comes to answer them, Fred will uh, will answer the questions. So this is how you will do it. And if, not, if everything doesn't get answered, just like Terry said, we'll stay on afterwards if we must, as long as it takes for about 30 minutes or so. I just contradicted myself for about 30 minutes, not as necessarily as long as it takes. But uh, Fred will also get a full report of all of the answered and unanswered questions. So uh, one way or the other, your, your question or concern will get addressed. So without further ado, we have a special guest today who's going to be speaking with Fred and pitching some of the questions that you submitted. Her name is Marielle. And Marielle is the founder and CEO of Disruptor, I'm sorry, Disrupt CRE an education and media platform dedicated to sharing the latest technologies and trends within the real, with the real estate industry. That sounds really cool. You're gonna have to share that website so we could all check it out, Marielle. Take it away. Thanks so much, Jeff. Hi everyone, good morning. Uh, I am excited to be here with you. You guys have some good questions already upon registration. So uh, Fred, let's get into some questions. Okay. Um, so you guys have some some yes or no questions that we'll tackle first, uh, and then we'll get into some of the bigger kind of trends amongst these questions that I'm noticing. So first and foremost, Fred, do you do installations, disposal, dishwasher, et cetera? We do installations for dishwasher disposals, microwaves, all the major kitchen and laundry appliances. Okay, yes. wonderful. Uh, we have a question about an ice maker making ice, but there is water on the bottom of the fridge and the ice dispenser is not working. It sounds like two separate problems. Water on the bottom of the refrigerator is usually a drainage problem within the machine, having nothing to do with the ice maker. Not dispensing ice is a different function and a different problem. Okay. E either one is easily addressed. 
Okay. Um, we have a great question, another great question about ice makers. Should they be banned from multi-level condos? Even though they're a source of leaks, it's not the ice maker that's really the problem. Leaking refrigerators have more to do with the water supply lines from the house or apartment to the machine. Most of the installations we're running into that are problems are plastic pressurized water lines. We recommend everybody change it over to copper. Copper doesn't leak. Plastic eventually will, it dries, it'll crack. It's a source of a problem that could easily be eliminated just by the changing of the installation materials. Now, I thought this was a really interesting question. I'm curious about the answer myself. So why has the appliance industry in America so dramatically reduced its supply? The answer we get from the manufacturers is COVID. Factories that produce the component parts are closing or have been closed for extended periods of time. If you don't have the materials to build the product, you can't. We used to run about a 90 day inventory on appliances in this country. I'm hearing from my customers that they have to order machines and they're being told four to six week waiting time. The Between the shipping problems that they had, port of entry, the manufacturing problems because of COVID has reduced the inventory, not just on appliances, but on even replacement parts. Parts that I got in 24 hours are now taking up to a week to get. So it's an industry-wide problem. If, if I may interject, um, if you hear this from providers, whether it's somebody like Fred with appliances, I ordered a home gym because I didn't want to go to a, to my regular gym during the, the COVID crisis and germs and, and, and things of that sort. It took almost two months for this piece of equipment that I ordered to come in. So what Fred is saying applies pretty much with uh, every service provider in our industry. Um, we have one more before we're going to get into uh, some bigger trends. Uh, how important do you consider it to use a manufacturer rep for repairs? Are all appliances equal? Do you need a specialist? I am an independent service company. <clears throat> Yet I insist on my people attending classes once a month for the manufacturer's updates and field fixes. The guy who's doing it part time because he used to tinker with his own machines, he's somebody who has to be avoided. Somebody who's doing it full time, uh, that's the person you want to use. Most of the legitimate full time workers are keeping up with the industry on a monthly or semi annual basis. We usually could get to you quicker than the manufacturer's rep. And usually that rep is a contract that's awarded that can be terminated on 30 days notice. So there are some things the manufacturers know better because they hide new problems that they're having with their equipment. They keep that in house. They're not sharing. We had a manufacturer a couple of years ago had an enormous problem with their ice makers, never admitted to having a recall. Yet for three months, you couldn't buy an ice maker from them because they cleared the shelves of their inventory all over the country. And they replaced it with an updated version. But how would you like somebody coming into your home and telling you you need an ice maker and you have to wait three or four months? And that's what we were running into. Yet the manufacturer never admitted to a problem. That happened to be one of the imported machines. American manufacturers tend to own up to their shortcomings, make it right and move on. I hope that helped with the answer. Okay. Um, now we have some kind of bigger trends that I'm noticing amongst these questions and it really comes down to mitigating risk, right? Mainly talking about floods and fires. So we wanna get into really, I think mostly from the flood standpoint, leaks. Uh, you mentioned hoses before. I think you'll get into that a little bit. And then 
from the fire side, maybe some of these kind of, um, you know, lint cleaning uh, in dryers, uh, et cetera, that, that need to be taken care of. So break it down for us. How can people really consider these, um, you know, mitigating risk in floods and fires? Well, like we talked about the refrigerators and just taking a look at the supply line, the water supply line behind the machine, go to your washing machine, look at the supply line. If it's a black rubber hose or a gray plastic hose, you want to change it to a woven steel hose. They're available at any decent hardware store and any appliance service company should be stocking them on every vehicle. It's a service we offer. If you can't do it yourself, we're more than happy to take care of it. But washing machine hoses, their failure is the number one cause of floods in this country, short of natural disasters. On the dryer side, the lint that collects in the exhaust vent, which is beyond the lint filter in the machine, but between the machine and where it exits the house, not just that little piece of hose behind the machine. On a family of four or six people, it should be cleaned out annually. On a single or a couple, you go every 18 months to two years. Problem we have with that is since it's out of sight, it's also out of mind. What happens is it collects lint in the exhaust. It causes the machine to overheat, which causes undue wear and tear on the machine. And since lint itself is a fire starter, as an example, the Boy Scouts of America tell you to take a bag of dry lint with you if you go camping. Lint will almost burn wet. So it's if it's a fire starter for the Boy Scouts of America, why do I want it in my house? I have a slide later on, you'll see. The lint we took out of a dry event, an eight foot dry event, it was enough to fill up a supermarket plastic bag. That's a fire waiting to happen. And drier lint fires are the number one cause of home fires in this country. Wow. So if you clean the dry event, you reduce the fire hazard, you increase the efficiency of the machine, you extend the life of the machine, you reduce your electric bill. There is no downside to keep it clean, but you have and, to remember to do it. And flipping back to uh, you know the, the hoses on the leaks side of things and flooding side of things, I know that that's a really kind of low barrier thing to do, but very similarly kind of out of sight, out of mind, right? That's not a very expensive or uh, time uh, intensive thing to repair or to replace. If you could do it yourself, it should cost you about $30 in materials. If you can't do it yourself, it's not an outrageously expensive fix. I know that on my trucks, we stock six hoses per truck because my men are trained to show it to the customer to avoid that leak or flood. What I don't want to hear is that they had a $50,000 insurance claim because the washing machine hose burst. Right. We had an incident uh, in a high rise where a hose burst on the 24th floor and they didn't know about it until water was leaking out of the ceiling on the fourth floor. This turned out to be a snowbird apartment. They did not turn the water off to the apartment. The hose failed shortly after they left building was primarily empty. The damage was in the millions of dollars, all for basically $30 worth of hoses. Wow. It was a problem that was easily avoided. So it's something that's dear to me. We don't make a lot of money on it, but it helps my customers. And that's what it's all about. Taking care of your own customer. You just see the downside enough to know how avoidable and unnecessary that is. Everybody knows somebody who had that. Right. Ooh. Um, okay. I, we have a couple more questions here, uh, specifics about this that I want to make sure to cover. So 
should we have the dryer vents cleaned in the individual houses? It sounds like the answer is unequivocally yes. Definitely yes. And do will you do that at a discount for owners in the association? We discounted if we're getting enough in that we could do it in the same day. Right. You can't keep right. sending a, a, a crew back every day for one vent. So okay. if we're going right. into a building and every building is different, we're more than happy to come in and give you a free estimate and what the discount would be. Okay. Great. Um, we have one more question about the uh, uh, front loader uh, washers. Uh, how many pods for front loader washers? <laughs> An important one. No, it really is because what customers doing, they have this misconception that the more soap, the better. And the reality is it's the less soap, the better. So I could give you an example. The average adult doesn't get dirty. My guys are on, they're laying on people's floors. We get dirty. A load of my work clothes gets two pods. My home linens, towels, towels are basically clean when you put them in the washer. You've showered, you basically blotted yourself dry. They're not dirty. You were clean when you put the towel on you. So one pod really should be enough for a full load of normal clothing. The important thing on, well, pods are all high efficiency soap. But look at the container it comes in. It should be an HE symbol, which is a low sudsing, high efficiency. The old cup and a half to a load, you do that, you're going to have a comedy sketch on your hands. Everybody else will laugh and you'll cry. And I even have a slide showing that. Funny in the movies, not funny in your home. Um, okay, uh, we have a few questions live here. And since we have some time before we're ready to get okay. started, we will dive into them. Um, does your company office offer service contracts? No, we're a COD company. We respond when we're needed. I don't want to knock service contracts, but those of you who have them, try calling on a Friday for a problem in season in Florida. And if you're lucky, they get to you Tuesday or Wednesday or Thursday. If you have a refrigerator problem, we're going to get to you within two hours of the time you call. Wow. And that's five days a week. Yet we also have emergency service available on the weekends and nights. For non-emergencies, you call us before 12, we're probably still getting to you the same day. You call us after 12, we'll see you probably tomorrow for non-emergency. But we decide what the emergency is. Your dryer not drying your clothes at three in the afternoon is not an emergency. But your refrigerator or your dishwasher leaking water onto the floor is. If you're an older person, you're afraid of slipping and falling. I'm afraid of you slipping and falling. I got to get that water off the floor as quickly as possible. So yes, we're going to get to you quick. Great, great. I hope that answers. Um, okay, so we got one more before we start. Uh, well, I know I know you're going to talk about what what kind of machines and what kind of uh, brands you service and specialize in, but we have a question: Do you service older high end appliances such as Viking, Wolf, Sub Zero? The we service all makes all models with the exception of Melee. Okay, that one was a quick one. So I think we can jump for one more, which is, um, do you replace uh, or rep uh, repair hot water heaters? No, we don't. That's a plumber's okay. issue. We okay. do kitchen and laundry appliances. Okay, so then we're not gonna talk about how often does a tankless water heater need maintenance because that's not your arena. No, I don't, um, it's not my... Bailiwick. Okay, perfect. And we are about to jump in so people can hear all about what you do and <laughs> what you specialize in. And I know, Fred, you're going to be available for about 30 minutes afterwards. If you guys do have more questions, leave them in the chat and we will revisit. Okay. okay.
Excellent. Thank you, Mario. And uh, you're not going anywhere, so hang around. Um, before we get started, I just want to briefly go over how you will get your credits and your attendance certificates once Fred is completed with this webinar, once we sign off. At the end of the webinar, or when you leave the meeting, because you don't have to stay on for the full Q&A afterwards to receive your credit if you need to go. So when you leave the meeting and or once we end the webinar, you'll get a window that a small little window that pops up with a link. You will click on that link and it will take it will then take you to this. You will then fill out this evaluation. It's not that long. It's 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 worse. It's not as bad as it looks. It goes quickly. And once you hit submit, we will then have the information we need for your attendance certificates and for to apply your CE credit. Then you will hit submit, you'll get a confirmation window. On that confirmation window showing a successful submission will be your link for the gift certificate for Fred's uh, company for A1 Appliance and Refrigeration Repair. That's all I wanted to say. Uh, Marielle and Fred, back to you and on with the course. I think we'll let Fred take it away with his uh, presentation. Okay. So we'll put up, I guess, the first slide. Oh, okay. <clears throat> Let me tell you a little bit about myself and my backgrounds. Uh, I've had an appliance service business for over 40 years. I hire, I train all my technicians myself. I was a trainer for a few of the manufacturers over the years. We also are the, we were the factory authorized rep for Amana, Maytag, for a while, uh, ASCO, and even GE. We're here in South Florida now eight years, and we're taking care of everybody basically from Broward to Palm Beach County. Um, next slide, if we can. We start with the, we're going to start with each machine. This is the evolution of a washer. And this is the first washing machine. Very efficient, very pretty, very hard to replace, but they wore out quickly. And the next slide, this is the predecessor to our washing machines. This is a late 1800s wooden washing machine. I happen to own it, it's in my house. I bought it at an auction. The only thing we ever needed to do with that is have basically a wooden dowel and a hammer to stop the leaks, but they worked. You could do one or two items at a time. It took all day to do a load of wash. You all remember this machine. This was on usually the back porch, the old ringer washer. Very little went wrong with it. Again, took all day to do a load of clothes because you only do one or two at a time. And then we have today's washer, which really hasn't changed much. It's gotten bigger and the controls have gone from mechanical to electrical and then electrical to electronic. They do a great job and there's not a lot you have to do to them, but there is certain things Example, you shouldn't do one item like a comforter. As big as these are, these are still clothes washers. All the clothing, none of the heavy bedding, no throw rugs. Go to a laundromat, kill their machines. These were not designed for it. Uh, next slide, please. To improve the performance of the machine, it's really about in a laundry room setting, signage, telling people about over soaping them, telling people about overloading them, and little signs don't do. Big signs, the size of posters, the bigger the better. And next, remember we talked about too much soap? Here it is. I opened the door of a guy's a customer's house, soap was coming out of the front door. It was 30 feet from the washer. It looked like a movie set. The poor man was in tears. He had used the old style soap and put a cup and a half in, basically for towels. And this is the result. 
it made a small mess. Here's your HE symbol. It should be on any soap you're using. But even with HE, you can over soap by using too much. Follow the manufacturer's recommendations. When in doubt, cut the recommendation in half. You see your clothes still come out clean. Next. We talked about the hoses earlier. Here's an example of a hose that's ready to explode. Rubber hoses have a two to four year life expectancy. Most people, when they put them on the first machine, stay on that washer and then stay on the replacement washer years later. It's there, nothing's gonna happen to it. Here's what's gonna happen. That hose is gonna rupture and it's like opening a faucet onto your floor. The next slide. Again, a movie set, good old fashioned Lucy. There's a hose that bursts. It's that stream of water. Very funny to look at the comedy sketch, the amount of damage in your home. We had one that blew out 2,800 square foot home, parquet wood floors, totally destroyed over $50,000 in damage without talking about the damage to the cabinetry or furniture, just her floor. This is the kind of thing that's avoidable. You just have to think about it. And it's a one-time fix. You fix it once, you're done for, for the next one or two machines. Next slide, please. These are the hoses we want you to use. They're available any decent hardware store, Lowe's, Home Depot, True Value, and any decent appliance service company will have these hoses on their trucks for the customers who can't do it themselves or don't know how or don't have the time. Now we'll go into dryers, the evolution. First dryer, the old fashioned clothesline. It worked great, clothes dried, they were a little stiff. A towel on a clothesline and you dry yourself with it, it's like putting sandpaper on your back. The shortcomings for this, you had to shake out all the bugs before you took them in the house. And in the winter, clothes froze. And if they fell, they literally broke like glass. Uh, next slide. The dryer from 50 years ago is pretty much the same dryer you have today. It's gotten bigger. Again, the controls have changed from mechanical to electrical and then electrical to electronic. They've gotten bigger, they've gotten more efficient, but basically the same machine, a motor, a belt, heating element, thermostat. That's about it. The things that you could do to help on the machine, you clean that lint filter every time you use the machine. You clean the exhaust vents periodically, depending on the usage, every one to three years. The, here's a great hint. Your clothes should dry in 40 minutes to an hour. If they take longer, you've got a problem. Address it before you have a fire. It's not hard to do. You all know how the machine is supposed to work. Problem is, as we own these machines, we get, we get to ignore noises. We tend to think it's normal because noise builds slowly. We tend to ignore the length of time it takes to dry because first it was 40 minutes, then it was 45, then 50. We became used to it, it became normal. But once you exceed an hour, time to have it looked at. Your problem is easily corrected before there's a major disaster. Next, please. We're talking about our signage again. In laundry rooms, I want everybody before they use the dryer to look at that ex filter clean it before you use it, and then clean it again after you use it. It's not repetitious. You're going to guarantee that the guy before you cleaned it. And if he didn't, you'll take care of it. Just one swipe with the finger, throw it in the garbage can. Most lawn tubes have garbage cans. This lint filter is an example of multiple uses without cleaning. When you could roll that lint up like an insulation, that hasn't been cleaned for multiple uses. That's destroying their own machine. 
Okay. Here's the, here's the exhaust vents. The one on the left is a white plastic vent, very popular in the 60s through late 70s. But we found out that as the plastic dries, the fire hazard increases. So it's been replaced with what you see on the right, which is basically corrugated aluminum. Very flexible, not a problem, still has to be cleaned. The lint you see is a picture we took that came out of eight feet of exhaust vent. Most homes have between 15 and 20 feet of exhaust vent. So if you multiply it, there's a lot of lint. That's the, there's your fire hazard. Next slide. This is an example of the inside of the exhaust vent. It's supposed to be a four inch diameter. The lint is so bad on the left that effectively it's about three inches. Losing 25% of its volume increased the drying time by double. The one on the right is what it should look like after it's been cleaned. This is an example of that little piece behind the machine. What's in the wall, we can't even show you. But if this is the example of what's outside the wall, inside the wall is just as bad. It should be cleaned. I can't stress it enough. These are just pictures of fires. We had one in a community not far from me. I live, of course, in Southeast Florida, concrete buildings. The fire was so hot that the stucco fell off the outside of the house. It almost looked like new construction, except for the charring. The good news is nobody got hurt. The bad news is house was destroyed. Something to be thought about. Dishwashers and disposals your two source of water and leaks. History of dishwashers, we started out with, of course, the washing machine person, except they use water and sand and they clean the dishes. Then they went into soaking and that worked pretty good. A little hard on the plates. Next slide. This is an electric sink. This is from the 50s. Most people have never seen this. First time I saw it, I was surprised but it worked. And then we went into today's dishwasher. It's again, gotten bigger, it's gotten taller. Not that it's taller under the counter, but the motor compartment has gotten smaller, which increased the internal size of the machine. It does a great, a, a great job. We've learned to, we've designed it now to use cooler water, but we extended the washing time. It's more efficient to run per hour. So really, even with the extended washing time, the cost of a load of dishes is less than it was 15, 20 years ago. Next slide. This is your first garbage disposal. I think I'm old enough to remember it. And the next slide. And then we move to taking the garbage and we either come we put it outside, we fed it to the animals, or we made compost out of it and we used it in our gardens. It didn't go to waste, but we got rid of it. Now we have today's garbage disposal. There's really very little to do to fix it when it breaks. You just replace it. The only thing that you could do is if it jams, you usually could get in there with a, they used to call it a Z wrench, you could get in there with a broomstick and try to rotate the bottom plate. What you don't want to ever do is put any of the degreases down there, the liquid plumbers, never in a garbage disposal and never in a dishwasher. Those, you do that to these machines, you will destroy them. The garbage disposal is a source of a leak under a sink. When it leaks, most people don't even know it until the cabinet rots away. What I suggest to my customers, under the garbage disposal, put a baking tin, collect the water. If you see water collecting, you know you have a problem and you haven't damaged your cabinets. To have that sink cabinet rot out on a 20 year old kitchen, you need a whole new kitchen. You can't match anything. So it's going to leak. Let's collect, let's protect ourselves and collect that water 
so we know there's a problem. Not a big deal. It's about a dollar item. Well, normally we would take a break, but we're not in person. So we're going to just move on to the evolution of refrigeration. We started with basically digging a hole in a hill, protecting it from the outside sun. We then moved on to the next slide, please, to the ice man. Carried that block ice. If you lived in a city, he carried it up flights of stairs, put it in your refrigerator, your ice box, and there was a pan to collect the water. Messy, but better than digging a hole in a hill. We then moved on to the ice box. I even have one of these. I use it as a liquor cabinet. Very pretty oak on the outside, brass on the hinges. We then moved into this machine, which was called a monitor top, about six cubic foot of capacity. Doors and walls were about four to five inches thick. And that round thing on the top, that was your motor. The good news is better than the icebox. The bad news is the refrigerant they used was ammonia. When it leaked, it was deadly. So they had to get away from that. And we went to Freon. Next slide. After the monitor top refrigerator, the only thing that's happened is machines have gotten bigger in capacity. Today, 25 cubic foot has become almost the norm. They've gone from, again, mechanical to electrical and again to electronic controls. These new machines all have at least one computer. Most of them have two. Enormous capacity machines. In the 70s, we raised families with refrigerators that were 16 and 18 cubic foot and thought these were hot stuff. Today, they're 25 to 30 cubic foot, yet the cost of running per hour has gone down. Unfortunately, the life expectancy has gone down. Better machines are still lasting 10 to 15 years, lesser machines, five to 10 years. Not a lot to do. There's, you can't even get underneath these to clean like we did years ago. The biggest problem we're seeing with these machines is odors. The easiest way to reduce the odors, take some charcoal briquettes, put them on a saucer, put them in the machine. Charcoal works better than baking soda. And then change the charcoal about once a month or so. Five pounds of charcoal should be a couple of dollars and it's enough charcoal to last you the rest of your life. You can't overfill these things but you can underfill them. Refrigerators are designed to run at a 75% capacity, minimum. You have less food in there than that. You're increasing the running time. You're increasing the temperature. You're even increasing the failure of the machine. The other problem we have is voltage surges. Computers are sensitive to fluctuating voltage. Every home should have a surge protector. In Florida, you could rent them from FPL for about $10 a month, or you could hire an electrician to install one at the entry point into the house. And I don't know the cost because we don't get involved with it, but I do recommend everybody having it. It'll protect all the computers on all your machines, and every machine has computers today. If it has an LED display, it has a computer and you need to protect it. Computers have become our number one failure component in every machine. Can't avoid it, but you can minimize the failure rate, the surge protector. Next slide, Jeff. Improving the performance, we talked about keeping the machine full. You don't wanna have it on exterior wall. Exterior walls get warm. Interior walls don't. Next slide, Jeff. We talked about changing from the plastic water lines to copper. Here's the example. Plastic's available. I don't know why. It has to fail over a period of time where copper doesn't. We, we talked about the odors, charcoal versus baking soda. 
We talked about keeping it full. Oh, we're going back to dishwashers. Okay. Want to improve the dishwasher performance and the disposal. The big problem we have with dishwashers, performance is run the hot water at the sink before you turn the dishwasher on removes all that cool and warm water before you're using it to wash your dishes. And for odors, take a cup of bleach and a cup of white vinegar, stand it on the top rack, and run the machine. As the machine runs, it'll dissolve the bleach and vinegar. It'll remove any food stains. It will remove any odors. It'll, it'll get rid of the soap scum that builds up. You do that once a year, it'll take care of, you'll always think the dishwasher's new as far as its look and its smell. If you live in an area where you have well water, you might want to do it about three or four times a year. Next, oh, let's just stop for a moment and talk about disposals. Problem you have with disposals is odors. Odors are eliminated. I call it the 616 area. You take six ice cubes and put it down your disposal. When ice shatters, it's like a lot of little knives. Cleans out all the little crevices. You take a lemon, cut it up, put that down. It'll sweeten the, the disposal. And then six more ice cubes after that gets rid of the pulp from the lemon. You're all set to go. The disposal doesn't smell anymore. In my house, I'm doing it about three times a year. It's not hard. Whenever you have a cocktail, you could do it. You're going to throw away the lemon anyway. Take care of it. Okay, next slide. Stoves. Original stove was just fire. And then we went to iron pots over fire. We had, remember the old cowboys, the chuck wagon. That's how they made dinner. As we evolved, we got fancy and we had indoor cooking. Amazing that people actually put out spectacular meals without having a thermostat to control the temperature. All they did was how many logs they put in. Same thing on the top. Terrific item held up. Evolution, the new stove. Very hard to find a stove with exposed coils today. All have glass tops. There's not a lot you could do. Cast iron pots on glass top stoves are a disaster. Very hard to put them down gently. Hence, we crack that glass. The glass is an expensive item. Just the pot, depending on manufacturer, could easily run between $150 and $400. And then you have the labor to put it in. We get $150 labor because it's not a two minute job. There's not a lot to do for maintenance. On glass tops, it's the cleaning. Easy thing to do is get a razor blade scraper, a flat scraper. And I use Mr. Clean eraser. Those two things keep my glass top looking pretty good. They're going to scratch and you can't stop it. This is why manufacturers change from white glass to gray or black glass. You don't see the scratches as much. There's nothing to do in the oven. Yet, if you could see the coils, you can inspect them. When you turn it on, those coils glow cherry red. Take a look. When they're heating up, if one spot gets redder than the rest, that's where that element is ready to fail. You want to be able to take care of it before it fails. The only thing you can do is change it, whether you do it yourself or you call a company like ours. These stoves have a tendency of failing on Mother's Day, Thanksgiving, Christmas, Easter Sunday, they know when the holidays are coming and they're going to wait till just before you need it. So if you know that the element is going to burn out, don't wait, have it taken care of. It's easy. You'll eliminate the let's go out for Thanksgiving dinner routine. And I hear about that every year.
And yes, these elements can easily be replaced. Don't call on Wednesday before Thanksgiving. You don't have enough time anymore. On the top, helping on the glass, don't take anything out of the refrigerator and put it directly on the glass. The cold from the refrigerator or freezer onto the glass can cause it to crack just by the temperature difference. If you lived up north, you've seen crack windshields. You hear from, I hear from customers all the time. They get up in the morning and the glass is cracked. Well, that glass actually cracked probably days or weeks before such a small hairline crack, they never noticed it. Overnight, expansion and contraction, it cracks more. There's nothing that people could do to fix the crack. You can't crazy glue it. And once it's cracked, you really don't, you can't safely use that stovetop anymore. If water gets into the elements, it'll destroy the elements and the switches associated with it. If it gets into the oven wiring, it'll destroy the computer that controls the oven. Basically, it will destroy the stove. So once it cracks, it really has to be addressed quickly. Liquid boiling over a pot, even the steam from making pasta will create enough liquid to get down into that crack and do damage. The stove, if you want to improve the oven, and make it more constant, get an old pizza stone, put it in the very bottom. You don't want to take aluminum foil and line the bottom of the stove. If you do, you want to put shiny side down, not up. In any case, if you put aluminum there, you will reduce the life expectancy of the elements themselves because you're reflecting the heat back onto the element, not allowing it to cool itself. It's not hard. People do it because they think, oh, I'll keep the oven clean. Most of us are self-cleaning. The cost of pushing a button and cleaning the stove is so minimal. You don't have to do anything. You just have to push a button and walk away. Sometimes you, if you don't do it often enough, you might have to do it twice. We do ours about every six or eight weeks. And we don't cook that much, but it's so easy to do. There's just really no excuse. It doesn't cost a lot of money, doesn't heat up the house. If you don't do it often enough, you do get an odor from it as things burn. Ovens clean by raising the internal temperature to 880 degrees and everything burns at that. Community kitchens in clubhouses, you have them. Not a lot to do. This is a picture of basically a commercial kitchen. It's a commercial dishwasher, two stoves, a couple of microwaves. Less is better. Most clubhouses will have a stove and a refrigerator. Most do not have a dishwasher. They don't really want you cooking food. They want you heating food up in clubhouses. So you're making coffee, you're heating up trays of food for a party. Uh, commercial kitchens are usually very sparse. So they can basically hose them down when they're not being used. Next slide, please. We talked about the performance. Well, the top left gives you the cracks and the bottom right gives you, if you look at those very white spots, those are hot spots. That oven element should be replaced. Also, the oven is pretty dirty. Uh, the future. We're gonna, we have today in test kitchens at these manufacturers we have refrigerators that don't make cold and literally will keep food forever because the purpose of the cold is to reduce bacteria growth or to slow it down. We have microwaves. Well, the next generation microwave will use light, not heat. We have sinks, but there's one. You don't have to do anything. You could talk to it. Well, we already have that. That's, that's within the last year or two. So all these things are on the cutting board. 
do we want to bring it out to our customers? Some customers are dying for it. Most customers are afraid of it. Some of us want the old fashioned machines. We want the dials that we turned. We don't want to talk to our machines. I'm not a big fan of accessory items. So I don't want to have a coffee pot built into my refrigerator. I don't want a computer built into it. All you're doing is who do you call when the computer in the refrigerator goes bad? Your IT man or your appliance guy? It's a question. I had a customer who just spent to me a ridiculous amount of money to fix his seltzer dispenser in his refrigerator. Seltzer is 39 cents a bottle. For what he paid, he could bathe in it. It's just another accessory. And it's the accessory items that are breaking. The basic heart and soul of the machines are really almost as good as they were 30 years ago. It's all, it's everything we've added to it. I like crushed ice. I don't need a coffee pot built in. Uh, GE had a Keurig coffee pot built into the door of the machine. I think they've gotten rid of it now. I believe Samsung has a touch screen monitor built into the door of their refrigerator. Problem is, it also controls the refrigerator. So when that computer goes bad, the cost is phenomenal. And the refrigerator break and goes down, no refrigeration. Their choice is fix or replace. And the replacement is high. And the cost of the repair is ridiculous. I'm a big fan of I want the toys that I'm going to use. I don't want to pay for toys I'm never going to use. So get the machines with the least amount of accessory items, not the most. Still get what you want. It's available. Today's market, we're seeing customers do repairs that I'm not a fan of because they can't get the replacement machine in a timely fashion. You might be able to wait for a washer or a dryer or even a dishwasher. You're not waiting for a refrigerator or a stove. And if you're being told six to eight weeks to wait for delivery, you wind up buying what's available, not what's good. I have my own personal opinion on what's good and what's not. Certain manufacturers I avoid. And that's strictly from a service point of view. I know the difficulties getting replacement parts and the price of these parts. I need parts availability in a timely fashion at a fair price. I need manufacturers who are worried about the service of their product because it's going to break. We all know it's going to break. To make it so hard to fix that the customer has to pay more money, there's no reason. Think about service. When you're designing a, a kitchen or a laundry room, think about the serviceman who's got to access this machine. I have one customer in particular, when I have to service her dryer, I have to disconnect her washer and take it out of the room. She pays for this. Had she thought about it, she would have made the laundry room two feet bigger. She designed the house. There was no reason for what she did. She could have made it accessible from, an, from the garage, but she didn't. So it's a matter of a little bit of thought. When you're redoing a kitchen, you're putting in a new floor. If you put it in on top of the old floor, you've raised the height of the floor. Sometimes you can't get the dishwasher out. This becomes a problem where the only way to get it out is you have to literally cut it apart. I've got tips for snowbirds or you, uh, if you have buildings that have a lot of snowbirds, what you could be asking them to do or checking on them. The rubber hoses, of course, number one. We want to turn off the water to the machine. That means turn it off to the washer, turn it off to the dishwasher, turn it off to the refrigerator. But better than that, we want to turn the water off to the entire unit or house. These valves that are in the house, what if they don't shut it down completely? We've all turned something off and it continues to drip. That drip in a washing machine 
will fill up the washer over time and it will overflow. We had one here in Boynton, Snowbird left, the water valve in the washer started to drip. By the time they knew about it, the ceiling in the unit below had collapsed. Now, that was also a Snowbird, there was nobody home. But the damage was enormous to two apartments. So I like turning water off to the product and I like turning water off to the residence or units. Every unit's got a off valve somewhere in the building. The other thing you wanna do, all these machines have computers. Even when you're not using the machine, the computer is powered off. I can tell you to turn, to unplug everything. It's a little difficult. Nobody wants to pull out their stove to get to the plug, but you can go to the circuit breaker box and turn everything off. I tell my customers turn everything off except the air conditioning and the main lighting. I've now protected everything electrically. So when they're not there, voltage surges aren't going to affect them. South Florida is the lightning capital of the country. A lightning strike within a third of a mile of your house can go through the ground and come into your house and do damage. Just got to think about it. I want to help people avoid some of the easy insurances or to minimize their problems with a little bit of thought. Most people don't think about it. They leave, everything should be good. All the machines have valves. You know the problem? Nobody turns them off ever. So when you go to turn it off, it's been years and they don't work. You can't turn them. You need to put a wrench on them. And then sometimes the knob breaks and you still can't turn it off. But if you turned off the water supply to the house, you'd be safe. Next slide. We talked about the circuit breaker box. This happens to be an old one. All the new ones are so well labeled. Just go look at it. They're all numbered. On the side of the box, the numbers are stamped in so every breaker has a number. On the legend of the box, the electrician wrote down what every circuit does. If you're not sure, find out. Sit, turn them off one at a time, see what outlets shut down, what lights don't work. A little bit of time goes a long way at the other end. Next slide. Appliance repair companies. We talked a little bit about contracts versus COD companies. If you're going to get a con take contracts, you want to find out what is their response time. What do they guarantee? What do they consider an emergency? Refrigerator failure in Southeast Florida, most people have some kind of medication in their refrigerator. Refrigerator goes down, this becomes a big expense. You wanna see what's covered on those contracts and what's not covered. Read the back of the contract. There's more ink on the back than the front. The back tells you what's not covered. What was covered five years ago on most contracts are not covered today. They used to cover computers. They don't cover them today. They used to cover faucets. They don't cover them today. You just want to be an informed consumer. I don't knock service contracts. I think they serve a place. I have friends who have service contracts. I have buildings that have contracts for everybody in the building. If it works for you, great. Funny thing is we on Friday as a company, we will go out and do one or two jobs for people with contracts because the contract company couldn't get there quick enough. They don't want to wait until Monday or Tuesday for their refrigerator. We get out there within two hours. Usually we could save their food. We tell them going in, they're not going to get reimbursed. The contract company, it doesn't pay us. They do. You're looking for response times. 
and and coverage. These are the important issues. And they're really written on the back of the contract, but it's usually in very fine print. Uh, just read it. We have some helpful hints. Uh, anybody who has heard me before knows my pet peeves. Rubber hoses, I guess it comes across pretty strong. Dryer exhaust vents, I do that. Uh, what we didn't cover is domestic machines, washers and dryers. They need a cool down period. They're not the laundromat machine. I tell people, rule of thumb, do a wash. When it's done, put it in the dryer. When it's done, put another wash up. The, per the person who does his laundry all day on Sunday, his machines last three to five years. The one who does one or two loads every single day, his machines last an extended period of time. Refrigerators, change the water filter at least every six months. Uh, the new machines, the better ones, they actually count, they measure the water. Uh, my machine at 300 gallons shuts the water off to the machine. So if I don't have a filter, I get no water, no ice. Uh, every four to six months and use manufacturers original filters. Aftermarket filters have a 30% failure rate. Manufacturers factory original filters have a 5% failure rate. The money you save doesn't save you any money at all if you have a 30% failure rate. So when you're buying the filters, you want to see that it's made by the manufacturer, not made for the manufacturer. So when you're buying them online, be very careful. They will both fit is what they do. Electric ranges, we talked about hot spots on burners, elements. We talked about cold cookware on glass top surfaces. You want to put something on the top of the stove, let it come up to room temperature. We didn't talk about gas stoves, which is not a popular item, but we do service them. If an oven takes too long to ignite, or makes a banging noise when it ignites, do not use it. Call a service technician. You've got a problem. That banging is a mini explosion. There's a problem with the ignition system and they wear out like light bulbs. You really wanna have it addressed. Oven should light in 60 seconds or less. If it's taking more than 60 seconds, there's a problem you need to address it quickly. You do not want a, anything more than that mini explosion. Dishwashers and garbage disposals. We talked about if it's not draining, do not put drain cleaner down the item. I had a customer put drain cleaner in her garbage disposal and yes, it started to drain. And two weeks later, it started to flood. Drain cleaner is a low base acid. It eats away at the seals. It eats away at the nylon components and most water appliances have nylon components now in the drain systems. So you wanna protect them. Not draining properly, call, get a service tech in. In a sink, if you have a double sink, Put the drain cleaner down the sink that doesn't have the disposal. Just don't use it in the disposal. Next slide, please. We talked about controlling odors. In washing machines, top loaders we'll talk about, you take a cup of bleach and a cup of white vinegar into a full load of hot water, no clothes, and just run the cycle. In a dishwasher, you want to take that same cup of bleach, cup of white vinegar, stand it on the top rack and let it run through. The disposals, we talked about the ice cubes. On the refrigerator, you want to use your baking soda, use it to clean. A little baking soda and water solution, clean the inside of the refrigerator. But if you want to control odors, 
two to three charcoal briquettes on a flat plate, change it every week till the odor's gone. I leave it in the, my refrigerator and change it on a, as a maintenance basis once a month. Odors is nothing more, assuming there isn't food going bad, odors usually are nothing more than a combination of all the odors of all the uncovered food over the years. It just leaks out from the insulation into the machine. Let's control it. It's not hard, it's not expensive, doesn't take up a lot of room, but don't put it in a bowl, put it on a flat plate. I don't even put it on a plate, I put it on a little uh, paper plate, so it works. Next slide. Uh, I think we did, we covered a lot. Uh, if you have questions, I will try to answer all of them. Uh, if I don't get to you, uh, just write them down and I promise an answer. It might take me a day, but I will get to every question, I promise. Uh, Marielle? Hello. Hello. Any new questions? Freddie, we're so please? efficient. We have time to spare. Yes, well, so. normally in a live presentation, there's questions constantly. So right. it usually takes about two to two and a half hours. Yes. So and well done. Would... We did have a lot of questions while you were chatting. Oh. Um, so oh. we will take some of them right now. And if. Uh, 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 Jeff? Yeah, just real, real quickly, Mariel, thank you. We do want you to do that. But real briefly, for anybody that needs to go and doesn't want to stay for the Q&A, if you leave the meeting, you'll get that pop-up window for the evaluation that, that came up on that last slide that we changed quickly. And what I'm going to do now as well, because I know some folks have issues with pop-ups and maybe pop-ups are disabled or, or what have you, I'm going to put the link for the evaluation right now into the chat area so that you will all have it and can click on the link straight from this interface. You click on that, the window with the evaluation will open. And remember, uh, once you submit the evaluation, you'll get a confirmation screen. On that confirmation screen, you will find the link for the gift certificate for A1. And the link is now there. Marielle, pardon the interruption, it is now back to you. Well, Fred, is there any any uh, thing you want to talk about about that gift certificate? Is it available for um, who is it available for once they have it? Once they have clients? it, they they could uh, if they're in uh, high rises, they can make copies and give it to their unit owners. It's good towards any repair that we do. It's not good towards the diagnostic fee, but if you're having a repair done, we waive the diagnostic fee. And I tell everybody, Great. do not present it to the serviceman when he first gets there. Present it after he's told you what's wrong and how much. It's a legitimate coupon. We don't raise the price to compensate for it. Great. Okay. All right. So let's take some questions. Um, we have a question from Ed. Is there any brand more reliable than the other Samsung, LG, Maytag? Uh, I touched on it briefly. Uh, what I'm about to say is strictly personal opinion. Uh, I tend to like the American manufacturers, which today are from high to low, sub-zero. Wolf, KitchenAid, Whirlpool, Maytag, Amana, and Gen Air. I'm not a fan of the imported manufacturers. Samsung, LG are Korean. GE Appliance Division is now owned by Hire, which is a Chinese company. Electrolux, which used to be Frigidaire, is owned by a Swedish company. None of those are my first choices. I do like the American manufacturers. Parts pricing is better. Parts availability is better. I still like buy American when it, whenever possible. They put their, the American manufacturers for the most part, put their efforts into mechanics 
not appearance. Uh, between everybody I mentioned who I like, you should be able to find something to suit your needs. When we redid our kitchen in our house, which is now four years ago, I told my wife she could have anything she wants as long as it's made by Whirlpool. I didn't pick models, but KitchenAid, Whirlpool, Amana, Maytag, Gen Air are all owned by Whirlpool. Sub-Zero is terrific. Honestly, I can't afford the product, but I also can't afford a Bentley or a Rolls-Royce. Uh, Wolf, great product. Again, beyond my price point. We service all the manufacturers. So I'm speaking from personal experience. I hope that helped. Yeah, wonderful. We have actually a couple of questions about which brand do you find most reliable for each appliance? So um, fantastic. Uh, and I know, I know, Fred, that you you know, encourage your clients to your customers to call you and, and ask you about these things. And you are that kind of resource for them, which is pretty, uh, I think pretty unique and special. And you're willing to give that advice if, if they're a customer. I have customers who take the advice and they've called me from the store while they're shopping. The salesman might not love me, but he's not <laughs> my customer. Right. And we don't sell new machines. So I'm not forced to sell what I own. We don't represent any manufacturer. I have no reason to push one over the other. I used to be a great GE supporter until they were sold to hire and the quality changed. Mm. I'm seeing machines that are 18 months, 24 months old that are falling apart. And I blame the manufacturer. You know, realize as a company, we're seeing 20 to 30 machines a day. So I think I'm better equipped to decide what's good or bad, at least a better opinion or more informed opinion than the customer who owns seven machines. She adds up all her neighbors together. I see more machines a day than they do. Mm. You know, yeah, let's say so. nobody's calling me to tell me their product is wonderful. They're calling me to tell me it broke. <laughs> All they want to know is how quick and how much. Those are the two key questions. Well, on American manufacturers, it's usually going to be quicker and it's usually going to be cheaper. To me, that's a big item. You know, cost is everything. We all have to be cost conscious of what we're spending and what we're getting for the money we're spending. So we have uh, another question. What should we look for when purchasing a water disposal? You have to be honest about what you're going to be using it for. You're not going to be, if you're not grinding up steak bones, then you don't need a one horsepower. On our service vehicles, we stock a half horsepower garbage disposal. It takes care of 99% of what people are going to put into it. A one horsepower will take care of steak bones. It still won't take care of broken glass or nails or pull tabs from soda cans or twist ties from the bread. That's going to screw anything up. So why spend the money? In South Florida, just like your water heaters, you assume a 10 year life expectancy. Garbage disposal should be eight to 10 years. Why spend the money for the more expensive one or the name? And just so you know, we're using Whirlpool garbage disposals. They hold up. All right. And it's a fair price point item. What else do we have? Okay. We got it. Yeah. We got a bunch more. So, um, do you know of any electricians that can install a surge protector for the home? Any licensed electrician is more than happy to do it. Okay. Uh, shop the prices. As I said, FBL rents them for $10 a month. Um, you have to decide what's best for you. I chose to rent. 
It's, um, it... Oh, well, we have we have this uh, another question from the same person. Is it regular charcoal for the fridge that you're talking about, like ones used for the barbecue? Which I think I think the answer exactly is exactly right. What when I bought my bag of charcoal, I I think I look for whatever's on sale. If you have a regular barbecue, when you're done with the refrigerator, using them in the refrigerator, use them in the barbecue, burn them. They'll work. That's awesome. But it's the same charcoal. You know, years ago, we used to tell people, activated charcoal. You'd have to go to a pet store because of the, they were so small, there was more surface area. More surface area, more odor absorbing. Well, what we found out is, a few charcoal briquettes on a saucer do the same thing for a fraction of the money. So a five pound bag is a couple of dollars. Five pounds of charcoal is a lot of charcoal. It, if you use it just for your refrigerator, it will probably last you the rest of your life. It'll be in the way as, as it turns out. In my house, I keep it in the garage because I don't want it in the, in the cabinet. Fred, uh how about uh, charcoal like match light? Should that be used or not? I would try to stay away from the match light because it's permeated with lighter fluid. I just want the charcoal. So basically right. get the cheapest thing you could find. The cheap right. ones will be exactly what you need. Perfect. Um, and I think, uh, okay, you covered the baking, uh, baking uh, soda uh, package okay. and the so lack of... Arm and Hammer, and I'm not picking on them, but it's a name I know. Baking soda is very effective when air passes through it. So if you take the top of the baking soda off and it's filled to the very brim, the top eighth of an inch is working. The rest is not. So Arm and Hammer, in their marketing brilliance, has figured out you're going to buy a lot of baking soda and throw it away. Right. Well... I'm basically cheap. I think well, if you if, just don't need it, you don't need it. Look, you know, we were talking about uh, odors on washing machines. And what I didn't touch on, people complain about the front loaders building odors or mold on that front gasket. The easiest thing to do when you're not using the machine, don't close the door all the way. Leave the door open a fraction of an inch. Let air to get in there. No more mold problem. No more odor problem. This was an old problem from 10, 15 years ago. When you close that door, you just made a Petri dish. So leave it open. But only open a quarter of an inch. It's, it's, it's easy. In my house, I throw a dish towel over the door. So when I close it, it doesn't close all the way. I can't even do it by accident. I have to protect me from me. <laughs> uh, and with the charcoal, how often do you suggest changing that? If you have an odor problem, I would suggest change it weekly. On a maintenance level, I would change it every two to three months. Okay, perfect. Uh, we have a question about where you're servicing I notice a 516 area code. Are you servicing Broward County, specifically Hollywood? We will go to Hollywood. So we will we will go basically from Hollywood all the way up to Stewart. That's our service area. Great. Um, what are your thoughts on induction stoves? Not a big fan. Okay. Uh, the repair, they, they work, but the pots and pans have to be right. The cost of repairs are very high, inordinately high. Um, those are my main concerns. It's like when they first came out with the open coil burners, which is now 50 years ago. If you didn't have a perfectly flat medium weight aluminum with a copper finished pot didn't work so well. People were throwing away pots and pans. Uh, induction, if you're not perfectly flat, you've got a problem. So it's, 
It sounds good. Look, I'm not a fan of convection. Uh, it works. Basically, what you did is you put a blower motor into a stove, and it cuts the cooking time by about a third. Well, if I'm in that big of a rush, I use a microwave. Uh, how about ventless dryers? The heat and humidity is still pumped into the room. Uh, in Florida, then you're going to pay to air condition that same room. I'm not even talking about the dust because usually uh, there's a ventless system out that you could add to any dryer. It's basically a water tank and you have to remember to change the water weekly, but it takes the hot air and pushes it into a water tank. The lint is supposed to stay in the water and the heat and humidity goes into the room. This was good on people putting dryers into usually high rises that weren't designed for dryers. There was no venting available. They came out with ventless dryers. You know, it's like they have, um, they call ventless air conditioners. You still have to exhaust that heat somewhere. So if you look at like a ventless air conditioner, there's a big hose, you have to put it outside. On a ventless dryer, better than nothing, but still all that heat and humidity is, is coming into the house. So it's not my first choice. Okay. Uh, another question about where you're servicing. Do you service Dade County? No, don't go to no. Miami Dade. Okay. We, uh, I can't provide the service that we want to provide by stretching my service areas so thin. I don't have the right manpower to, to take care of the customer. So we've limited to Broward and Palm Beach County. And we do go up as far as Stewart, which is really Martin County. Okay, great. Um, we have a bunch of questions about <laughs> the charcoal. In order not to get the fridge dirty, should you put the charcoal inside a plastic bag? I, I think you mentioned just put it on a saucer or some sort of paper plate. Just put it on a paper plate. If you put it in a plastic bag, it won't work. No air gets to it. Right. Uh, it's dirty to put it onto the plate, but once it's on the plate, nobody's touching it anymore. I right. put three or four on a appetizer size paper plate. And then when I'm going to throw it away, I just throw away the plate and the charcoal. I don't even touch it. When I'm putting it onto the plate, I'm using rubber gloves and then throw the gloves away. But once it's in the refrigerator, it's not making anything dirty. Um, we have uh, more of a comment, but maybe you can shed some light here. My refrigerator installer used a hardened tubing that he said is better than copper. It was ZRX or something like that. Any thoughts? Hardened tubing. Maybe like that plastic tubing that you had referred the, to. The gray plastic, uh, which is harder than the white milky plastic. Mm. Um, haven't seen a failure yet, but it's fairly new. Uh, what I have seen where a lot of customers are doing, they're getting the woven steel water lines designed for refrigerators to connect from the wall, which is usually copper, to the machine. I don't want to knock this hardened plastic because I don't know enough about it. But since I'm old school, I like the copper. The trick is leave enough copper behind the machine so the machine can be pulled out for service. So it's usually you leave one or two loops in the back. The cost is a couple of dollars. And then you attach it to the machine. So when the machine is being moved, you're not stressing the actual connection. You, there's a, a strap that you could use, which we use. Um, a lot of manufacturers supply the strap, and then I see that nobody, the installer doesn't bother to use it, which I don't quite understand. It's there, cost you nothing. But people take shortcuts. And usually nothing happens. It's when it does happen that it's, you look at it and go, why? Um, 
We have a question, what water purification system do you recommend to remove fluoride and chlorine for kitchen under sink or counter? Well, the filters that are on that are built into these refrigerators that you're supposed to change, the ones that today are more efficient than the ones we used to put under the sinks 20 years ago. So I think they're fine. Uh, ones other than the sink, I don't get involved with those at all. Uh, in my house, we use refrigerator water even to make pasta. We don't use sink water. I don't think I need a second filter system. I have a good filter system, as long as I change the filters periodically. So it's, uh, if you're living in an area where you don't have city water, you have well water, that's a whole different animal. And that I suggest you talk to uh, a, a, a good plumber uh, let them guide you. But those of us who have city water, it's not bad. I want to get rid of the chlorine as much as possible, some of the other impurities. Uh, I think the filters in refrigerators, factory original filters, do a, a terrific job. Changing them is everything. And the older machines, you could leave it in for years. I don't know why anybody would want to do it. At that point, once it's over six months old, I'd rather have no filter because all the impurities that the filter collected eventually will start to pass through. Hmm. Interesting. It's, again, an opinion. That's all it is. Um, well, Lisa says no refrigerator water dispenser at my home yet. So she wants the sink system. Okay, what she can do, um, Go to a, a Home Depot, a Lowe's, a True Value hardware store, and see if you can get a filter that you actually splice into the water line behind the machine. Hmm. Uh, we used to do that before the filters were so, that before the filters were built into the refrigerators. We would add a filter behind the machine. Now, because of the physical size, if we did it behind the machine, the machine would stick out an extra inch. Uh, a lot of times we added them under the sink in the water line that went to the refrigerator. But even those, you have to know to change them period periodically. And how do you access the water without that dispenser being built in? You mean without the filter being built in? Well, there's a, if you have a water dispenser, Right. So she, I think she doesn't have the water dispenser in the refrigerator, so she's looking at a filter for her sink. Okay. That's something you've got to talk to a plumber. Sure. You know, okay. I'm pretty knowledgeable about my products, but there's a limit to what I know. There's a time where you pass it off to the plumber or the electrician or someone else. You know. All right. I think that's, that's all our questions for today, unless you wanted to add anything before we pass back off to Jeff. Well, I Jeff, waving at us. I actually have a question yes, um, and I hope I will throw you off guard, but you know, um, I'm in my out of state home. I'm in a, in a place geographically where we can have basements. I know you can't really have that in Florida. And in my basement, I have a bar with no water line near the bar. So I bought one of those tabletop um, ice maker machines. Do you have any experience with those like do, oh. in terms of maintenance or can they be running all the time? They're not expensive, you know? Um, here's my only suggestion. I would use bottled water. You know, um, right. it's inexpensive because of the reduced m amount of minerals, okay. which will prolong the life of that table ice machine. Okay. Uh, just like I only use filter water for my coffee pot. Yeah, same here. You're right. Uh, it's not a question of taste. It's a question of wanting to extend the life. I'm cheap. I don't want to buy a new <laughs> machine every year. Not yeah. if I can make it every two or three years. Yeah. Um, boy, it'd be a, nice if you could run a water line. Yeah, yeah. It, it's it, in terms of the location of where we have it. It's almost more cost effective to replace that ice machine if it breaks every couple of years, based on the location of where the bar is. 
<laughs> so, but but thanks thanks for thanks for that answer. I'll I'll take that into consideration with the bottled water. Okay. I hope I helped everybody. I hope I gave some everybody something to take away as a positive, a little bit of knowledge. I'm full of useless knowledge except for what I know in my in, my industry. Um, you had a lot of people say thank you, Fred, and it was very helpful. So I think people learned a lot and, you know, a bunch of people are excited, I think, even to maybe see a recording or, uh, you know, connect with you after this. Look, anybody with a question, um, I do have a, a website. And if you, uh, it's uh, capital A, one appliance, FLA at Gmail. At any time you have a question, if you send it in to me, I'm not telling you I look at this thing every minute of every day. I don't. But I look at it when I first get in the office in the morning and I look at it before I close for the day. So I promise I will get back to you with an answer. Um, and uh, the, the logo link for Fred's website for A1 is the logo on the evaluation. So at the top of the evaluation, if you click on the A1 link, it'll take you right to Fred's website. Thank you. And you want to talk a little bit about our website, Jeff, because you're the expert. Well, certainly. Uh, we have a growing uh, uh, list of service providers that will appear on tskmarketing.com. And the beauty of our interface as it begins to grow is that it's sort of like a one-stop shopping. The goal anyway, is for one-stop shopping for community associations and association board members and CAMs. You could even submit a generic basic RFP straight to the vendor. So it's a couple of less steps uh, to have to go through because we vet everybody. We make sure all of their uh, licenses and certifications are up to date with the state of Florida or they cannot be on the website. Uh, so it'll also save you a step. So for instance, with Fred, if you wanted to go to TSK, Mar if you stumbled upon tskmarketing.com and need some appliance repair, you you'll find A1 and, and uh, Water Restoration Group on there right now. You need to reach out to them. You can do it straight from that site without having to go elsewhere, which is uh, a wonderful thing because we know for our managers how busy many of our cams are. Uh, so if we can reduce that search time, that's a win-win for everybody. So that's tskmarketing.com, and you can contact Terry about our future events, as well as participating on the website and being one of our service providers if one of you in our audience happens to be uh, looking for another avenue to reach the gated communities and decision makers of your HOAs, condos, and co-ops. Thank you, sir. You're welcome. So we will have another one going on in March. Most likely it'll be WRG, but they haven't confirmed our date yet. So we're waiting for that. And, and we really hope to see you all in person. We, we, we can't wait. This is great. This isn't going anywhere. These webinars are here to stay, but uh, we really can't wait to share those bacon and eggs and omelets and toasts and croissants with you once again at our, at our breakfast. The day will come. <laughs> yes, I got my shot. I got my first shot yesterday. I'm very excited. That's great. So, um, Everything uh, went really well. Thank you, Fred. Um, and what else do we have to talk about? Um, our evaluations and... Yeah, the link is in the chat. Uh, you'll also receive the evaluation when you leave the webinar. Uh, you'll get a, a, a window with a link to click on. In addition, I'll have that link in a third place when you receive our follow-up email tomorrow. There'll be a link for the evaluation if you haven't already done so, as well as a link to download the slides from Fred's fantastic presentation today. Okay, thanks everybody. I think we're over and out. All right, stay safe everybody. Once again, Happy New Year, Mariel. You have been a wonderful uh, guest uh, interviewer today. Thank you, we hope you can do this again in the future. Fred, great job as usual, uh, as reflected in our comments. Uh, I think everybody agrees. And Terry, so it was good to see your face. Yes, we Have a good day, uh, really everybody. stay at it, Jeff. Thanks a lot. All right, bye everybody. Bye-bye.